the, uh, the message for today, I, I really said, Lord, where am I going with this? And this was Monday, he actually, as, as Pastor Tim preached last Sunday, and then Monday the Lord just kept saying, I want you to, to focus on this this week. Well, I understand why, because two and a half weeks ago, uh, when I threw my back out, it was one of those things where, you know, and we've talked about this in men's Bible study all the time, that you have to have the scriptures um, ingrained within you so that when these attacks come physically, you really need to be ready, right, <laughs> Donna? You know what I'm saying? That you know you're not you don't just fall apart, and you just and it's hard. And when it's older, you get the and the physical attacks come. Sometimes you forget how when you were young you healed so quickly. But I was so encouraged, and I'm blessed. Peggy is a blessing to me because there are times I wanted to wimp out. And uh, he, she goes, where's your faith? I said that because she laughed, okay? <laughs> I don't want you all to think that she's mean. She's not. She just, she says, Rob, where's your faith at? Okay, let's, let's is, is this a faith thing or is it a physical thing? And, uh, you're, and if you have a problem with women uh, or wives telling their husbands biblical things, then you got a problem with me because I, she's my all in all, we are side by side, I trust her, she trusts me, so, you know, and uh, I just said, oh, I just shook my head and looked at her, okay, I'm just saying, I said, yeah, I needed that word from God, okay, and if you ever get that attitude, like, I really needed that, but then the Holy Spirit just started to convict me, he said, where is your faith, Rob, and I mean, you, it, it can be anywhere you want, but where is your faith, and so little by little, I just, okay, Lord, where do I go with this? And and she just, you're, you'll, you'll laugh at this. She says, well, maybe you just need to move a little more. Maybe you need to stretch and twist and eat, take it easy, but just do it slowly and see what happens. And if it's something else, then go to the, go to the doctor. So within, within a day to two days, I started feeling a lot better. And I've, yesterday, I actually got to weed whack. You probably don't even notice it. But when it's this high, you know what I'm saying? So um, it, it's interesting because my message for today is stay the course. And I'm not going to tell the joke about, you know, the aircraft carrier uh, captain and, he's, and it's really foggy out and he sees this light coming towards him. And I'm not going to tell you that story where he, he tells the uh, radio man, you know, message that other ship. I'm a, uh, you know, United States aircraft carrier coming towards you. You need to make a... a steer 20 degrees to the west and I said no and then back came a message no you need to go 20 degrees to the east and so on back and forth and finally he said well I am captain so-and-so of the US Navy and and all he heard back was I'm a lighthouse <laughs> you know you're coming right at me okay but uh, that's not the course but anyway that there is wisdom in that that when the Word of God tells you something and it is the light to us then we need to we need to listen. And, and at times, it's hard. If you're in pain, if you're financially struggling, if you're hurting because of a loss, all of the above, it's hard to stay the course. At times, it really is. <coughs> Excuse me. That was really good. <laughs> so stay the course. I looked up the definition because I'm sure none of you know what it means, right? Keep going strongly to the end of the race or the contest. Pursue a difficult task or activity to the end. To continue with the process and effort, even though it is difficult. And, you know, my son Matt, he, every time we told people when he was running that ultra marathon, they all said what I thought. But deep down, I was, I was real kind of proud of him. I mean, how many of us can run a mile, let alone 147 miles, or 151, whatever it was that he, he made, he ran before he passed out? And, you know, in his heart, he knew he needed to stay the course. He knew where the course was, and he even tells us if he would have stayed on course the whole time, in that, is it a 47, 48-hour time period, he would have actually beat the record. He would have made it all the way to um, just this side of New Jersey. But he and his buddy got off course. And they finally figured out that they were off course, and they got back on course. And, 
And three miles before the end, he passed out. He couldn't do it anymore. Being awake that whole time, and, and, and his body is still recovering from that. But I started thinking, you know, he decided he wanted to stay the course. And I started thinking about that. How many of us, when we were younger or when we were older, we knew we were supposed to do something, and no matter what, we did it. Now, look back. I mean, all of us have those... Um, those stories. We all have those moments in time. And I, I, started, I started thinking, I said, well, w when was mine, Lord? Where was mine? And then he started reminding me, almost every day you have to stay, stay the course. You really do. But I wrote back to my son this morning, and I said, you know, I'm really proud of you because you stayed the course. You went to the, the umpteen ends of physical exhaustion. And I'm not saying go do that. Don't do that. But to him, he needed to do that for himself. And he, he has a strong relationship with the Lord. He didn't just do it out of um, vanity or anything such as that. But uh, so I asked myself, I said, Lord, where, where did I have that drive? Where did I, in the physical sense? And when I was 18, 19, 20 years old, I had that physical drive where I needed to do that. And as I got older, I realized, that Paul the Apostle speaks about this, he said, physical um, fitness is good, exercise is good, but your spiritual life is more important than anything. And I started thinking about that, and I thought, you know, when we need to stay the course, we need to do it not just for ourselves, but we need to do it for the people around us. Author Jeffrey Holland uh, said, stay the course and see the beauty of life unfold for you. Or quit. You just quit. How many of us just say, you know what, I give up. When I was in the Navy, I saw a lot of guys in boot camp just give up. And I said, I'm not going to give up. Number one, my mother and father never allowed us to quit anything. Now, I don't know how many of you ever dealt with parents like that, but if, if we told our parents, well, we're going to quit this job when we were teenagers, they said, you better have another one in line or you're not quitting. You know how, am I right? And so every once in a while, I hear somebody, I quit this job. Well, you got one lined up. Nope. Okay, do you have money saved up? Nope. <laughs> how are you going to live? <laughs> you know, and so it, it was interesting. I, I just looked back in those moments and when I, I thought what this man said, he goes, stay the course and see the beauty of life unfold you. And sometimes when you're on that course, it's not so good, is it? It, it can be really rough. The seas can be rough. The road can be really bumpy, especially in Pennsylvania. Do you truly want God's best in your life? Do you, do you truly want to grow and mature as a Christian and walk in a relationship with your Creator? And every individual in here is at a different space, spot, area of their, of their Christian walk. Quit trying to be at the same place Pastor Tim is, or quit trying to be at the same place Donna is, and so on. We all have had different experiences, different environmental situations, different physical and spiritual situations that put us where we are today. How we stay that course will... will truly determine where we are going. You can decide to go off course, like Matt did. He didn't really decide, it just suddenly happened. And in the area he went off course, those of you that know the Croydon area in North Philly, <laughs> not a good place to go off course. Not a good place. But he had the protection of our Lord, Psalm 91. But, you know, often we don't realize that God has that everything planned out for us, but he is a, he's a gentleman. He doesn't force us to do anything. He doesn't force you to get saved. And you don't get saved through osmosis. You don't get saved because you go to the Lutheran church, because your parents started that church. A lot of, a lot of these churches around here, there are people that are going to church there because their great-great-grandparents went to church there or started the church. How many people have I talked to who have said that? Well, I can't come to your church because my grandparents started the church there and so on in different places. Like, really? 
Well, are you learning anything? Are you maturing? Are you finding what God wants for you to do in your life? You, and you'll say, well, I already know what I want to do in my life. I know what I want to do. I'm going to do this, this, and this. So how does the eye feel? Has your eyes gotten away? Has, how's it working for you, doing it all by yourself? You know, once you know what God wants you to do for your life, and everybody goes, well, I don't really know. And you, you, you might think that, oh, you, God, God has this map, and he's going to show me the map all the way to the end of my life. It's not going to happen. And everybody goes, well, am I supposed to be a preacher, teacher, evangelist, and so on? I don't know. What do you, you're supposed to walk as Christ did, imitate Christ, right? It doesn't matter where you are working at. I'm trying to tell you that you could be working you know, at an auto shop, you could be working at a medical facility, anywhere. You could be retired, and you still need to do what God wants you to do for your life. You just got to, you can't, you say, but I'm not doing anything for the kingdom. Well, why aren't you? How many times can you minister to people? Remember, minister means to serve. And many of the people in our church, that's your job. Whether you realize it or not, you're servants. You work at hospitals, nurses, and so on. And you're serving somebody, right? So you are doing what God's called you to do. But are you doing it with the flair of Christ that, that um, you know, like salt and pepper has a, a taste? Do people see, taste and see that you are of the Lord? Or are you of the world? Do they say, wow, that's a really worldly person you have there. Psalm 119 in the Message Bible. A lot of the scriptures I'm going to use today, for some reason I'm stuck on the Message Bible this week. In Psalm 119, uh, 1 through 8 in the Message Bible says, and it's, some of it's really, really good. He says, um, you're blessed when you stay on course, walking steadily on the road revealed by God. Oh, you mean not revealed by your own senses? I told you, it's interesting that when you become a grandfather, you start telling your grandchildren, well, when I was your age, okay? I remember, honestly, the first time I ever had somebody do my hair, because I told you I had an afro. I'm looking at Skylar just shaved his, so I'm just, I'm sorry, buddy. But uh, I wanted to be a beautician. But I also wanted to be a race car mechanic. And I also, you, you see, I had all these things I wanted to be. And finally, I came to realize when I took the Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery, ASVAB test, I, I wouldn't be a very good beautician. I was terrible at typing, so that blew that out. And they said I was really good at electronics. So I went in the Navy, became an electro, uh, electronics technician. And so for a while, people go, well, is that God, was that God's will in your life? I'm sure it was, because that's where I got saved. And the man who helped turn my life around on that ship, my, my uh, close friend Steve, he was on that second cruise that I was on, and he helped me turn back from my real wicked ways back to the Lord and, and get me where I am today. Even though it might have only been three or four months I was with him on that ship, it changed my life. He helped me get back on course because I was going a direction I couldn't, I couldn't survive. I guarantee it, I would not have survived. And as so, you know what? As soon as I felt like I was going the right direction, you know, suddenly things started falling into place. Suddenly. I love the preachers who say, watch out for those suddenlies because that will happen. When you suddenly surrender, and I literally did that. I said, okay, Lord, I surrender. You know, after you tell somebody you're going to kill them because they blasphemy God, you can't get much lower than that. And when I finally surrendered and I apologized to the person, I went to the Lord about it, all of a sudden things started falling into place. I still had the same job, but my heart was different. And people began to see a difference in me, especially my family. That blew them away. My family, they were shocked. And, and I don't think they thought it was a good way at first because they weren't into religion. And see, to me, I just got to tell you, there's certain buzzwords that really bother me. 
religion really bothers me because I used to get that thrown in my face. Well, that's just religion. You'll get over it. But when you've had a real life-changing moment and you know he brought you out of the pit into, the, into paradise, you're not going to change. Nobody <clears throat> will convince you otherwise. You'll say, well, that's just you, Pastor Rob. You know, I told you, I dabbled in all the other little New Age stuff, you know, before I met Peggy. And none of it was, none of it filled the void that I had. None of it did. And that course that I was on, like I said, there were moments I wasn't sure I was going to survive. But I did have people praying for me. And I had mentors in my life. And that's what we really need to look at. So where it says, you're blessed when you stay on course, walking steadily on the road revealed by God. You're blessed when you follow his directions. Remember, there's always the opposite. If you don't, you're not blessed. Doing your best to find him. It says, that's right, you don't go off on your own. You walk straight along the road to set. You, God, prescribe the right way to live. Now you, ex you have, it says, now you expect us to live it. You prescribed it, you expect us to take it, to live it. Oh, that my steps might be steady, keeping to the course you set. Then I never have any regrets in comparing my life with your counsel. I thank you for speaking straight from your heart, Lord. I learned the pattern of your righteous ways. I'm going to do what you tell me to do. Don't ever walk off and leave me. Now see, when the, the psalmist, when he wrote that, he was speaking from a human point of view. Why? Because how many of us have been rejected in our life? Right? We've all been rejected one way or another. And so we try to compare God the Father with um, people that have rejected us. You know, and we'll just, you can't do that. He is perfect. And not just was, he is perfect. He can't mess up. Because if he did, the whole universe would be destroyed. He has certain laws that he has put into position that cannot be changed. And the biggest one is he cannot lie like a human being. So I told you, when my, my father wasn't the perfect father, but when, it be, when I got saved, all of a sudden, look, there was my example. He was my example. And I think that really bothered my real father. Because I spoke, I spoke about Jesus like he was, he was my best friend. And that really irritated my one sister, my middle sister. Because she'd had some bad um, situations with Christians. You know, we've all, had, we've all been bad representations sometime or another, haven't we? Admit it. You know, when I used to go to the bar on a Saturday night, and I was saved. People say, you weren't saved. You went, I was saved, okay. I know I was. And when the bartender tells you, you shouldn't be here. I mean, God uses a bartender to tell you you shouldn't be here. Something's wrong, right? You're not on course yet. So it's one of those things where <clears throat> God wants the best for you. And too many people say, well, my real father treated me like this. My real father did that. Or my parents or my, my uh, foster parents did this to me. My mother did this to me and so on and so forth. But you know what? Once you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior and you realize that you can't make it to heaven on your own, that the only way to heaven was because the blood of Christ covered our sins so that we could be perfect once again, when you realize that, when you come to that realization, say, Lord, I've received what you said concerning the blood of Christ covering me and, and being literally, you sacrificed your life for me personally. When you come to realize that, it'll change your life forever and nobody can, can convince you to get off course. You're the person that convinces yourself to get off course. Don't blame, ever, don't blame mommy and daddy anymore. Don't blame your brother or your sister or the pastor or the pastor's wife. If you get off course and you're born again, and you're spirit-filled, it's your fault. I'm tired of getting blamed for everybody else's problem. Yes, I blow it. I do make mistakes. Once in a blue moon, no, I do make a lot of mistakes. But, but the ultimate thing is, when you stand before the Father, 
I'm not going to be next to you. You can't point the finger at me. You can't point the finger at your mom and dad no more. Well, my mommy did this to me. Are you an adult? Grow up. As old Kimmy used to say, put your big boy panties on. I guess it should be big girl panties. Anyway, you know what I'm saying. And uh, it's one of those things where as he, God shows you the course in your life, I'm sorry, but you're going to go off course once in a while. That's just normal. But I guarantee you turn to the Father, you'll come right back on. Maria Ann Snellneck, I hope that's how you pronounce it, from Flowing Faith, she shared, when things get tough, we are tempted to quit. But as it is in the darkest moments right before the dawn, the best thing comes for those who stay the course anyhow. And okay, you know me and my squirrel moments. What's it mean the darkest is before the dawn? Well, on our way back from McDonald's last night with my granddaughter. Sorry, Josh, you weren't supposed to know about that. <clears throat> we, she goes, oh, look at the sunset. It's beautiful last night. Then I said, well, honey, look at the moon over there. She goes, yeah, the, well, how? And so she didn't understand the moon and the sun and how you get eclipses and all that other stuff. And I just, I said, you know, it's always darkest before the dawn, right? Why is that? Because there's no more light. The sun's down, or the sun's getting ready to come up. And the moon, which is on the opposite side of the sun, is gone completely down. So it's always really dark right at that moment. Now, if you've ever been up here when there's a full moon, and then all of a sudden the moon goes down and the sun hasn't come up yet, it's really dark. But right before that, when the moon is nice and bright, it's really bright. So that she just, she was amazed at that. She goes, but look how pretty that area. I said, that's because the sun is shining this way and the sun's rays are reflecting off the moon. And she's just, wow, that is really neat. Well, it's always darkest before the dawn. And we always tell everybody, especially those who are dealing with things, don't give up. And we see it so often. Pastor Tim and I and, and Marge and Peg will teach you how to get through these things through what the scriptures say. I can't tell you how many people I know just finally give up. They finally just say, I, can't, I just can't do it anymore. And do you think their life got any better? It got a lot worse. It got a lot worse. I invited somebody uh, to come back today and, and share a testimony. And all I could hear was, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't think I can make it. Well, I'm, I am praying people back that have left, that have discovered that you know what? The grass isn't always greener on the other side. And people say, oh, that's just an old wives' tale. Have you ever watched a baby calf? We just, we, we have a lot of them around here off and on. And what do they always do? They always try to get through to the other side. And Pastor Tim and I are witness to the one that we were raising up here, a little bull. He would stick his head through that steel fence to get that one blade of grass. And then we'd have to cut the fence to get his head out of it. He didn't learn. I was three or four times he did that. So finally, I quit cutting the fence. I just lifted it up and shoved his head back through. He did not like that. Call me a terrible person. I, I think he might have learned, but I'm not sure. I haven't, he hadn't got his head stuck since then. But you know what? Our, our biggest problem as Christians is uh, we don't allow God to teach us, and we don't retain it, or we're just being bullheaded. So, I love this. This woman said this the awesome statement. Okay, you say you want to do you want to do so much. You want to do. I gotta say this right. You want to do so, but how on earth are you able to to do what God tells you to do to stay the course? And this is what she said. The best thing to do is to stay in God's presence. If you run, you lose. But if you stay in God's presence, if you don't give up, you win. So wait on God, stay in his presence, and he will help you to stay on course. Staying in God's presence is the most important thing to do, no matter what. If you're in a relationship, if you're a husband or wife, and you feel like giving up, look, seek, and hang out with the presence of the Lord. And begin to pray like you've never prayed before. And I don't mean just asking God, 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 help, I want this, 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 and this. Just say, Lord, speak to me. 
Have you ever just shut your mouth and quit begging for stuff and just say, speak to me, Lord? And then even write it down. I've done that. I, I can't read my own writing. I'm a sloppy writer, but I can type really fast. So I've done that before. When I really be searching, Lord, what do I do? And I'll just sit there with my word processor, and all of a sudden, I'll, I'll feel, and, you, and I told you this before, when God speaks to you, even though it might be like a rebuke, it'll never be a negative, in my opinion, rebuke. Instead, he will tell you a positive way to fix it. For example, um, you'll say, well, Lord, how do, I, how do I quit drinking? Hannah, you and I can relate, okay? Lord, how, how do I quit drinking? Oh, and you can sit there and beg him forever. Oh, Lord, help me stop drinking. Help me stop. When you say, Lord, I need to stop drinking. And then you shush your mouth for a minute and you listen. And he begins he begin to say, stop this. Do this because my daughter, I love you so much. I want the best for you. My son, I want this for you. And when you begin to come into my presence, and honestly, you'll hear, you'll hear your inner voice will tell you, God is speaking to you, and he's telling you the way to get it, the way to do it. And people, I don't, I'm not saying I hear an audible voice. The only audible vo voice I heard from a long distance off was my mother yelling it was time for dinner, okay? But that inner voice is so loud sometimes, it's louder than my mom was. A lot of times, actually. And God wants to, to speak to your inner voice, and he wants to show, well, we're so busy yakking, we're so busy being negative, we're so busy speaking negative things on everybody else and on ourselves, and your, your father wants to speak those positive things on you. But you can't hear him because you're too busy talking. This woman went on to say, all the blessings flow from the presence of the Lord. But if we run, we don't get rid of the problems. Instead, we get rid of blessings and God's help. In that sense, the choice should be very easy, right? But we still don't make the right choice. The choice is hard because we can't see or understand always the solution that God has for us. But we need to trust and stay. My pers this lady's personal experience, she said, has been God always comes through. Not as fast as I hoped hope for or the way I wanted to, but at the right time and at the right way. Now look back in time. Has that happened to you? And I told you before, Peg and I have done a lot of soul searching, a lot of reminiscing, and, and you know we, we were blessed to take our daughter-in-law out to, um, out to uh, dinner two days ago, a couple days ago, with her, you know, with my son and, and my other son. And it was so cool because watching these young people talk back and forth, we looked at each other, were we that young? Were we that young? Oh my, we were. And I thought, oh man, but look how much we've learned. Look how far the Lord has brought us because we've always said, whatever you want to do, Lord, whatever you want to do. That day when both of us, we came to each other, oh, 38 years ago, and we said, what are we going to do? Are we going to hang out in Walla Walla, Washington for the rest of our life? Are we going to both just have mundane jobs and uh, not really do what God's called us to do, but just hang out? And we both said, we need to move west, or sorry, east. I know that's weird. Most people go west. We went east. And you know what? Once we made that decision as a couple, we had peace. And how many people, nobody could sell their house at that time because at that time, I think it was, interest rates were 12 and a half, 13%. They complained about seven right now, which is terrible. But we sold our house instantly. We sold my truck. We, I told you this whole story before, but God gave us peace. Came all the way across the United States in the middle of snowstorm after snowstorm in February. Survived so much, and God had jobs waiting for us. We never, ever quit a job without another one right there. God, from, from back 38 years ago up until now, has always provided. Has it been easy? No. And that's what I was trying to say. We look back in time, we're going, wow. You see what God is doing. Are you excited about it? 
You know, you're saying, but I don't know where I'm going to go from here. Quit trying to look so far ahead. Just deal with today. I, I just really, I challenge you to say, Lord, okay, I'm not feeling real good. And when my back was way out like that, I, ugh, I couldn't do anything. And nothing's worse than hearing Pastor Tim mowing and weed whacking when I should be doing it. I wish I couldn't hear him working out there because it just drove me nuts. But my wife kept saying, take your time, heal up. And I was blessed. But I really wanted to overdo it. How many of us try to go the wrong way because we have to? No, we don't have to. It got done, didn't it? You know, not quite as good as it should have been, but it got done. But so many of us are just, we're just looking a week ahead and we're going, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And he says, shut up and listen to me. I know that's a bad word. When I was a teacher, I never let anybody say shut up. That's a bad word. But sometimes that means shut this mouth so that we can hear what he said. That's why one mouth, two ears, right? There's a king called Hezekiah. He received a letter from the hand of a messenger, and it read, Hezekiah, and he read it, and Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord, and he, and he spread the letter before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, and this is in Isaiah 37. And uh, basically, his enemies were saying, you know, you're going to be wiped out. Israel's going to be wiped out. Jerusalem's going to be wiped out. You, who is your God? How is your God going to take care of you? So he, he went to the Lord. He said, Here's the letter. What's gonna, what are we going to do? And uh, hmm. when doing so, I'm going to paraphrase it, he just, the Lord spoke to him and said, I'm going to take care of you. Isaiah got a hold of him and said, yo, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to wipe out 100, I think it was 180,000 men. The Assyrians were going, going supposedly going to go into Jerusalem and wipe it out completely and just totally destroy everything. And God said, no, I'll take care of this. Assyrians woke up the next morning, 180,000 men were dead. The king of Assyria said, huh, I'm getting out of here. He turned around and hit the road, Jack. And so Hezekiah knew, because he, he went to the father and he said, I can't do this. We're going to be wiped out. And the Lord blessed him. How often have you had overdue bills? Or you've had some, a diagnosis that you didn't like and you felt empty. Did you do what Hezekiah did? Many of us have. And sometimes it didn't turn out how we expected. You know, nothing's worse than to see your loved one pass. Nothing's worse than that. And, and you'll never get that out of your, your mind. You hope you never have to see it. But then comes peace, doesn't it? Then comes peace. It's not easy. No, God never said it'd be easy. But then comes peace. If you what? Trust in him. If you, I don't know how people do it, with it if, they don't, if they don't know the Lord. I honestly don't. I don't know how somebody could um, do C CPR on their husband without knowing the Lord and, and not going crazy afterwards. Honestly. And, you know, every time I call 911 when our... When, um, when Doreen, Philip, and Charlotte, all three, were passing away or had passed away. And they said, well, you've got to do CPR on, on your two disabled children. I said, doctor told me I can't do that. If I do, I'd kill them. Well, they were, I know they were already dead, but what do you do? So I began to pray over my speak life into you in the name of Jesus, and it didn't work. It didn't work. Well, as a preacher, how do you think that made me feel? As a Christian, right, Deb? I know. I, you, you speak into them, and you keep doing it until you're exhausted. And, but it didn't work. Do you just curse God and die? No. no. You trust him. You trust him. And, you know, losing, you know, the three, the three kids in 10 years, that was challenging. But I look back on those days, those times when God used the words of my mouth, the words of my wife's mouth or my children to bring blessings unto other people. When I spoke in, like what did they say, Peter's mother-in-law was sick 
Jesus raised her up from the dead or healed her. Every time I, I think about that, I think of the time Peggy and I prayed over my mother-in-law and spoke life into her, and the next day she was, she was, she lived another three years, and she was flirting with all the male nurses. You know, it just blows, blows you away. Or Pastor Tim and I, when we were called down to Reading to pray for Butch, another Butch, okay? And uh, he literally, he was huge, and he was filled with fluid. I mean, he looked like the Michelin man, right, Tim? I mean, it was, he was huge. He was huge anyway. He was 450 pounds anyway. So picture this man even bigger. So he lived, what, another year, two years? And that's not what killed him. He was back home doing physical therapy, and he, he fell, hit his head, and, and died. Wasn't even anything. But so you look back and say, well, Lord, thank you for using me in this situation. But, Lord, it hurts. He says, stay the course. He keeps saying, stay the course. Even though Paul was in prison, he kept telling everybody, stay the course. In Ephesians chapter 4, and verse 1 in the message, it says, in the light of all this, and I love, again, how the message guy put it, in the light of all this, here's what I want you to do. While I'm locked up here as a prisoner for the master, I want you to get out there and walk. Better yet, run on the road God called you to travel. I don't want any of you sitting around on your hands. I don't want anyone sitting, strolling off down some path that goes nowhere. And mark, and mark that you do this with humility and discipline. Not in fits and starts, but steadily pouring yourself out for each other in acts of love. Alert at noticing differences and quick at mending fences. Wow. Wow. Just that alone. Think about that. We were talking about um, where does power come from in uh, men's Bible study. And the big thing was power comes from the Lord. But it always comes from the Lord for those who are, and this is so hard for me, humble. The word humble kept coming up. Ugh. It's like the fruits of the Spirit. You know, sometimes I just like to throw that scripture out because I don't pass the test all the time. But, you know, it doesn't matter. We don't throw the word out. The word is our map. And so that's hard. Verse 4 in Ephesians. You were all called to travel on the same road in the same direction. So stay together both outwardly and inwardly. You have one master, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. Who rules over all, works through all, and is present in all. Everything you are and think and do is permeated with oneness, with his oneness. But that doesn't mean you should all look and speak and act the same. Out of the generosity of Christ, each of us is given his own gift. And the text for this is, He climbed the high mountain, he captured the enemy, and seized the plunder. He handed it all out in gifts to the people. It is not true that the one who climbed up also climbed down to the valley of the earth. Is it not true? I'm sorry. That the one who climbed up also climbed down to the valley of the earth. And that the one who climbed down is the one who climbed back up to the highest heaven. He handed out gifts above and below, filled heavens with gifts, filled earth with his gifts. He handed out gifts, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, to train, to train Christ's followers in skilled servant work, working within Christ's body, the church, until we are all moving rhythmically and easily with each other, efficient, graceful in response to God's Son, fully mature adults, fully developed, within, without, fully alive in Christ. That sounds... Now, if you don't understand what that is, he's saying, Paul said, Christ is the one that had to go down to the depths of the earth and, and steal the keys of sin and death from the devil because Adam and Eve gave them up. He took those, and then he led the captives that were in paradise, not in heaven, because of his blood covered their sins. He grabbed the people that were in paradise, which was across the chasm from from hell or Hades, and he took them up to heaven. That's what he's saying. And when he did, the Holy Spirit, they sent the Holy Spirit, God sent the Holy Spirit to come within us and give us all kinds of spiritual gifts. Here in this church, we believe in the spiritual gifts that are still for today. That God didn't just say, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, which gift do you get? You know, No. God gives the, uh, the spirit gifts to, to his children. 
you just you had to believe it, receive it, and, continue, and walk in it. But too many people, oh, no. When the apostles left, they decided to go ahead and get rid of those gifts. So who, who decided when those last apostle died? Well, wait a second. But they still had the gifts the first 120 years at least that we know of. And all the apostles had died. So who made the choice? Well, well they finished writing the Bible. Well, when did they finish writing the Bible? That was what, in the mid-1500s, 1600s? So they're all confused. God isn't. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. In 1 Peter 4, in the Message Bible, uh, starting at verse 10, that's funny. I just, uh, I don't have verse 10, but anyway, uh, in, starting at verse 7, it says, Everything in the world is about to be wrapped up. Take nothing for granted. Stay wide awake in prayer. Most of all, love each other. As if your life depended on it. Love makes up for practical, practically anything. What do they say? Um, love covers a multitude of sins. Be quick to give a meal to the hungry, a bed to the homeless, cheerfully. Be generous with, uh, with the different things God gave you, passing them around so all get in on it. If words, let it be God's words. If help, let it be God's hearty help. That way, God's bright presence will be evident in everything through Jesus. And he'll get and he'll get all the credit as the one mighty, the one mighty in everything in course in in course, in course to the end of time. And I like how he put that. He goes, "It's all for the glory of God." And again, on men's Bible study, we talked about that. How many of us want the glory instead of giving it to God? That's not what we're here for. We're not here to get the glory. We are here to give the glory to God. We're here to be a blessing to help other people. That's why our ministry's name is Elisha's Home and Ministries. The whole name is Ministry of Helps. But every Christian should be helping in whatever way God calls them to do. And you might not have that extra $100 to, to hand to the person at the grocery store, but you might be the person that opens a door for the person in a wheelchair. You might be the person that picks something up off the ground that fell, that nobody else will grab. You might be that person that stops and helps somebody across the street. You might be that person that you have that extra little bit of money that you can pay their electric bill without them knowing it. You might be that person. But you don't want the glory. You give the glory to the Lord. Somebody comes up to you and says, well, somebody just gave me this. So, well, praise the Lord. Well, how do you know it was God? You know that old joke about the, the woman who lived next to the atheist? And the atheist goes, woman, where's your God? You're starving. You don't have any food. You're, you're just having a terrible, terrible time. She goes, oh, I'm going to believe God is going to bless me. God's going to give me the food that I need and pay my rent. I believe this. And finally, he goes, you know what? I'm just going to go get a bunch of groceries and drop them at her door, knock on the door and run. Let's see what that woman says about her God. So she opens, you know, she opens the door and there's all this food there. And he jumps out and says, ah, so did your God do that? I bought that food for you. I did it with my hard-earned money. And she goes, oh, praise the Lord that he used some heathen to give me my dinner. Now think about that. God uses all kinds of things. And we have to remember that. And I, I'm not busting on people that don't believe. I'm just saying it takes a lot more faith to be an atheist than it does to be a Christian. In 2 Timothy 4, it says, you're going to find that there will be times when people will have no stomach for solid teaching but will fill up with spiritual junk food catchy opinions that tickle their fancy. They'll turn their backs on the truth and chase mirages. But you, keep your eyes on what you're doing. Accept the hard times along with the good ones. Keep the message alive. Do it. Do a thorough job for the Lord. So my question, are you fully persuaded that God is who he says he is? Because you're not going to follow the course of somebody who doesn't know their the course, right? You want to know how many times? It's, it's interesting. You, you've heard my stories, and Tim and Josh, all the kids have been with me. I'll wear my Forrestal hat, and uh, somebody will stop me. Oh, you were on the Forrestal, blah, 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 you know. 
And I, it must have been a couple weeks ago, I met up with a guy that was, a, he was on a destroyer. He was a little, a lot younger, I'm just a lot younger than me. And he goes, you were on the forest fire. I said, how do you know about that? He goes, well, we saw it in boot camp. And I said, oh, man. So it was one of the worst ships to be on because they had video of people burning and dying and 140, 150 men dying. So we spoke for a couple of minutes, and he said, well, so what did you, what did you think about the high seas? I said, I don't know, but I would not want to be in a destroyer like you were. He goes, oh, you've heard about that. Destroyer is one-fourth of the size of an aircraft carrier, maybe even smaller. And they, go, they have to strap themselves in their bunk if they're not on duty in some of the high seas. Well, I told him, I said, you know, and, and I'll share this with you. If I didn't trust the skipper of that ship, I wouldn't have been on there. Because when you're sitting there and you're hitting 40, 50, 60 uh, foot waves with an aircraft carrier and you feel like you're in a cork, you're, you are the cork, you better trust who's driving, right? And I kept thinking, what did I get myself into? I told you I'm afraid of large bodies of water. Why did I join the Navy? I know. I just didn't want to be like my brother, who was Air Force, and my sister, who was Army. I just didn't want to do that. I didn't want to be, a, and I didn't want to be a Marine. Okay, none of our Marine people are here. I just, so I joined the Navy, and, and I knew how to swim, but I just don't like big bodies of water. Well, then I realized when you're in a big ship, and you're going to the North Atlantic, and it's, you know, t oh, 10 below zero outside, and you're still hitting these big waves, you better trust the person that they're going to be on course. Well, how about in life? i tell you, now I will tell you this, I trusted God more than I trusted that skipper. I know that, I said, you know, Lord, you've got this skipper through more, more storms than this. So I know I'm trusting my life in your hands and in his. So my question for you, in Hebrews chapter 6, are you fully persuaded that the man, the God, the creator, who says he will take care of you and and bless you and be there for you. Are you fully persuaded he can do that and he will do that? So in, if, I'm going to probably end with Hebrews chapter 6. And you know how I love Hebrews 6. I haven't preached on it in a long time. So, and this is the, again, this is the message Bible. So come on, uh, leave the preschool, thing, I love this. Leave the preschool finger painting exercises on Christ and get on with the grand work of art. Remember, it says, leave the elementary teachings, okay? Grow up in Christ. The basic foundational truths are in place. Turn your backs, <clears throat> turn your back on salvation by self-help. <coughs> Excuse me. And turn and turning and trust towards God, baptismal instructions, laying on hands, resurrection of the dead, internal judgment, God helping us, we'll stay true to all that. So basically he's saying, you know, salvation is great, but okay, it's time to grow up and get into the, real, the really, really neat, cool stuff, is what he's saying. Verse 4, once people have seen the light, gotten a taste of heaven, and been part of the work of the Holy Spirit, once they're personally experienced the sheer goodness of God's word, and the powers breaking in on us, if then they turn their backs on it, washing their hands of the whole thing, well, they can't start over as if nothing happened. That's impossible. Why, they're, why they've re-crucified Jesus. They've repudiated him in public. Parched ground that soaks up the rain and then produces an abundance of carrots and corn, for the gardener gets God's well done. But if it produces weeds and thistles, it's more likely to get cussed out. Fields like that are burned, not harvested. And in that scripture in the NIV, basically what he's saying is if a person turns their back on God completely, totally turns their back and then doesn't do anything for the Lord, acts as if they were never a Christian, it's very hard for them to go back and receive Christ once again and be totally set free. Once they have publicly done that, and you can read that for yourself in Hebrews uh, 6, 1 through, uh, 1 through 8. And I don't know about you, that'll, that'll challenge you, but there's more. In the, in the Message Bible it says, I'm sure, that, I'm sure that won't happen to you, friends. I have better things in mind for you, salvation things. God doesn't miss anything. 
He knows perfectly well all the love you've shown him by helping needy Christians and that you keep and you continue at it or you keep at it. Now I want you I want each of you to extend the same intensity toward full toward a full bodied hope and keep at it till the finish. Don't drag your feet. Be or be like those who stay the course with committed faith and then get everything promised to them. There's so much in those scriptures and I just, and you, you need to read the rest of the chapter, but it's so important that you realize that when you stay the course, you will be blessed. And that comes only, I hate to say this, with age, with time. And a lot of people say, well, I don't have time. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. God, God gives us that time. But are you willing to give it all to him? Are you will, willing to surrender it all to him? I know about you, but when I finally surrendered that, and I told you that before, it changed my life. And it doesn't matter what age you are. I know, you know, Gary, you got saved at 50 or 40, how old were you? At 45. I mean, that is a blessing. And I told you just recently that I did a internment for that gentleman who got saved at 75. That's just too close. That's too close. He lived another 10 years, but he lived that 10 years for the Lord. And his family came back to the Lord, and it made a big difference. It really did. So as, as I close today, I really want you to, to contemplate a few things. Do you trust the one who says, read this map, follow this course, and you'll be okay. You're going to make it. Or do you trust the government around us, the, the different, different things that people tell you to do, the gossiper on the telephone, who do you trust? I just, you know, you, I hate to say this, but there's a good chance you might have to make another choice like we did about two years ago. Did you hear that our president decided he's going, he wants more money for a new vaccine? And he says, oh yeah, everybody will have to take it. Not me, but that's up to you guys. That's, it's truly up to you. Some of you might get ran over as you drive by, uh, walk out to your car and have to get your leg operated on. Are you going to do it? Well, that's a choice you have to make. I hope you would do the right thing. You can't expect your pastor or your best friend to make life-changing decisions for you. You can't expect the government to make life-changing decisions decisions for you either. You have choice. And ultimately, I don't care what politics you have. I don't care how old you are. The biggest, most important choice of all is Christ, your Lord and Savior. And if, if you ran from him, maybe he is. Like I told you, my first three years, I got saved in boot camp, but for three years, I lived like hell. Are you that person like I was when I finally rededicated my life to Christ? That's just, these are things that I, I, I think about a lot the older I get. I see, I see young people just tearing their lives apart. I spoke to somebody on Wednesday, asked how a, um, a person who's, who used to come to our church asked how his son was because she used to date him. Oh, he was doing good, but now he's back to doing drugs again. Oh, and he has a new baby. The guy's in his 30s, mid-30s, and he's still doing drugs. He has a new baby. He has a couple other kids. People, when are we going to grow up? When are we going to quit thinking of ourselves and thinking of the people all around us, taking care of the people around us and blessing those around us? When are we going to change? It's all, it's your choice. It's you stand before God. You know, you say, but my, but my spouse or my girlfriend or my boyfriend, they want this or that for me. Well, that's good as long as it, as long as it lines up with Christ. I, I don't know about you. When I, when I made that decision to, to surrender everything to Christ, and my best friend said, you know, if you really want a wife, if you want, Paul the Apostle said, you know, not everybody is to be married. 
And it's like, well, I'm not talking about me. I need to get married. You know, I, I need it. You know, I have to get married. I was one of those kind of, Gary, quit laughing, but it's true. I had to get married. And uh, what did he do? <laughs> and my wife laughs at me. I'll sit there and, and I'll say, Peg, I said, you do not realize how God turned me around. She goes, oh, I think I do. I said, no, you don't. <laughs> and she goes, what do you mean? I said, the places I've been, the things that I've done. She goes, I don't want to know. I said, I, I imagine, but you've already confessed all that, and God's changed you. I said, I know, but man, I was stupid. <laughs> but he totally gave me everything I wanted once I surrendered. He gave me a godly wife, lots of awesome kids, a challenging, adventurous Christian life. I've always, and, and I'm blessed. And I'm blessed beyond measure. I have favor with God and I have favor with man. And it spills over onto my congregation and onto my children. If you come to this church, you're blessed. And if you're not, you need to get blessed. Just saying. And you need to start speaking favor into your life. You've got to start speaking. Don't just say, woe is me. Don't do the Eeyore trash. Oh, I just don't know what's going to happen. No, don't do that. I, I need to start hearing positive things come out of your life, out of your mouth for your life. Not just because I'm not doing the positive thinking thing. I mean, it's, the Bible says faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Faith or stuff comes by, come, will come because of how you speak it. If you go up to a police officer and you call him every dirty thing in the book, I guarantee you're going to get every kind of, you know, ticket he can give you. But if you, if you say, you know, I'm sorry, you're right. I did this, I did that, I did this, and I really appreciate everything that you do. Uh, I'll pay my ticket, you know. That happened to a, um, a man that we know. He was coming back, remember that? He was coming back from the hospital after seeing his wife uh, down in Scranton, and he, and he was what, he's doing 80 miles an hour in a, um, in a construction zone, and he got pulled over by a state patrolman. Am I right? He got pulled over, and he knew he was wrong. And he just said, oh, I'm sorry, I did it. Go ahead and write me the ticket, blah, blah, blah. And he told the, he told the state patrolman what was going on. He, he goes, I don't want leniency. He goes, I don't have any money to pay this ticket, but I'll get the money. Just, just give me, the, I, de I deserve it. So what did the state patrolman tell him to do? He goes, okay, this is the date you're supposed to be, and correct me if I'm wrong, but this is the date you're supposed to be in, in, um, in court. Make sure you show up. He goes, oh, I, I, I will, even if I don't. He goes, no, if you show up and I don't, it, they'll throw it out. And make sure you plead not guilty. Well, that would be lying. He said, just do what I tell you to do. So I know, it sounds kind of like you're doing the wrong thing, but the state patrolman was trying to bless him. Am I right? Is that, is that about how it went? I'm not, it wasn't Gary, but it was somebody he knew, I'm just saying. And, you know, the interesting thing was, the man was humble. He's always been humble, but he was really humble. He was that guy that goes, oh my gosh, I blew it. I, really, I can't, you know, and how many people we, we know get killed in these construction zones? And that state patrolman blessed him because he knew it was real. When you mess up, Humble yourself before the Lord and the person you messed up with. Watch what happens. You, you watch. You'll have, you'll have God's favor and you'll have man's favor. But you have to have the presence of God in your life. You have to. Even if you're messing up, go and receive his presence. Let's all stand and we'll pray. And I'm going to pray for the food too. Because when we're done here, remember it's pot of plenty. And there's lots of food out there. You just grab a plate and go when it's time. And uh, I just, you know, stay the course. I keep hearing that. How many of you ever watched the movie Patriot? He kept telling his kids, stay the course. Remember that? Stay the course. Stay the course. Father, I thank you and I praise you for this moment in time. This just, it, it's just uh, like a puff of smoke, they say, in time where we all can meet and we can all be there for one another, love one another and, and bless each other. And Father, if there's anyone here that's never received Christ as their Lord and Savior and realize 
the sacrifice that he made. Let today be the day. They say, Jesus, just come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. And if there's any of us here that need to rededicate our lives to Christ, and then I'm not pointing any fingers because the last couple of weeks there were moments boy, I had to repent for a lot of things. Let today be the day. You know, I'm dedicating, I'm surrendering my life to you, Lord, and, and I'm believing for your favor and for man's favor that as I learn the scriptures and I walk with you, I will become a strong, godly, loving Christian. Hate will not be part of my language. I thank you, Father, for this moment in time, and I praise you. And I ask, Father, that as we sit around and we have fellowship around the table, I ask that you bless the food and all the hands that prepared it. And for those that couldn't be here, that we would take food to, to those people, maybe a neighbor or somebody we know that could use a nice meal. That there'll be so much left over that we can just we can give it away to other people. I just thank you and I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great day in the Lord and be blessed. And uh, don't forget, like I said, pot of plenty. And uh, I, I just I just want to encourage you. Now, if there's any of you that need prayer for healing or anything else, please feel free.